Hello, Professor. Well, uh, good morning, distinguished morning. guests, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Mieczysław Kuczma, and it's, uh, it's my great honor to be moder the moderator of this public lecture, which is hosted by the Poznan University of Technology and in uh, cooperation with the city of Poznan within the program entitled Academic Poznan. Uh, then an initiative of this lecture was born in and was proposed by the Faculty of Civil and uh, Transport Engineering. And today, uh, our lecture today is an eminent scientist and civil engineer, Professor Herbert Mank from the Vienna University of Technology. And uh, let me at this place express my deep uh, gratitude to Professor Mank for accepting our invitation, for preparing the lecture, and for being with us today uh, uh, within this difficult pandemic time. Now I would like to ask uh, the Rector of Poznan University of Technology, Professor Teofil Jesionowski, to say a few words. Mr. Rector. Thank you very much uh, for the introduction. So, uh, distinguished Professor Mank, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it is a great honor to attend in this uh, very important event. Uh, thank you once again to Professor Mank uh, that accept our invitation. And of course, uh, we are waiting for, let me say, absorption, unlimited knowledge, which will, which will be delivered by uh, excellent distinguished professor. Hope that I, uh, let me say, uh, few words understand from your lecture, of course, because I'm chemist, but I hope that you will also describe some information regarding materials and uh, its importance in civil engineering, mechanics, and other areas. So let me also mention that it is very, very important to, let me say, attend in these uh, lectures, uh, which uh, are organized uh, by our okay. city, Poznan, and of course, our university. And we are extremely sad that uh, uh, you cannot attend, let me say, physically at our city, but uh, we have opportunity due to, let me say, new tools to uh, have, uh, let me say, uh, very good experience with this event. So once again, thank you very much. Uh, and of course, uh, let's accept uh, my invitation uh, after, let me say, pandemic uh, time to uh, visit our university, our city. And thank you very much for, let me say, previous cooperation, but we are open for new future, better future. Thank you once again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and, and now I would like to, to briefly introduce our speaker today. And uh, uh, I'm doing this on behalf of the Dean of the Faculty of Civil and uh, Transport Engineering, Professor Jacek Kielecha, who unfortunately cannot be with us today. So in, in few words, I can say that uh, Professor Herbert Mank is a world white, uh, renowned scientist and civil engineer with outstanding scientific and organizational achievements. He has contributed a lot to and has a uh, great uh, impact on the development of science, engineering, and international cooperation. 
That is why the task of presenting all of, the, of Professor Monk's numerous achievements and various activities seems to be impossible. So let me just highlight the main of them and I will focus on, uh, on facts and numbers uh, because they say uh, for themselves. So let me start with the beginning. Herbert Monk graduated from the Vienna University of Technology in 1967. And since then, since then he has been affiliated with uh, the Vienna University of Technology. Uh, there, three years later, he defended his doctorate and in 1977, he defended his habilitation. In the meantime, he was many times on research, research leaves of absence uh, as a Fulbright scholar or uh, an, uh, scholar of another institutions and visited, um, uh, has spent some years abroad in the US, Japan and uh, China. And in fact, during that time in 1974, he defended his second uh, doctorate. It was PhD uh, with major in structural engineering and minor in mathematics. And we, we can see now, and we can, we uh, in, actually in every, every work, every paper of Professor Monk, his mathematical attitude to solve engineering problems. Uh, actually, uh, already yesterday, we could enjoy the, his excellent lecture and uh, his mathematical approach. The lecture was uh, delivered uh, with, at the seminar of the Faculty of Civil and Transport Engineering. But coming back to, to the university, Vienna University, uh, Professor Monk has, uh, uh, has, uh, has played uh, many important functions. Uh, uh, let me just say he served as, a, as, as head of division, uh, director of institute, dean of faculty, vice president of, of university. And the second uh, characteristic feature of Professor Monk is his activity outside uh, the home university. He has taken action in many institutions, uh, uh, serving as, let me just uh, look as uh, Secretary General and President of the Austrian Academy of Sciences, Vice President of the International Association for Computational Mechanics, President of European Community for Computational Methods in Applied Sciences, and uh, for many years is connected with with China, we can say, but with China, Chinese universities. And in particular, since 2007 and then 12, he has been professor of the, the Tongji University in Shanghai. And um, another, another uh, activity was, uh, uh, was a mission uh, of, it was a UNESCO mission to, to China, but and uh, it was in 1981 or, or two, and probably from that time, uh, there is this strong sympathy and, uh, and attitude of Professor Monk to this region, I would say. As fruits of his great activities, I can, uh, I can uh, recall tw uh, uh, Professor Monk offered, co-offered or co-edited 23 books over 500 papers in scientific journals, over 500 scientific presentations, including 60 plenary lectures and 35 keynote lectures uh, uh, at conferences and con uh, international world congresses, and also 100 guest lectures at universities and academies of sciences. Here, a uh, Polish accent may be also recalled. I mean, Professor Monk, uh, gave just uh, two, uh, I mean, uh, many lectures, but 
I will recall the lectures which was given by Professor Mang at the International Conference on Computer Methods in Mechanics. So in particular in Zielonagura in 2009 and in Lublin 2017. Professor Mang was organized of, uh, on many conferences, including the fifth and the sixth World Congress on Computation and Mechanics. He, is, uh, he served on the uh, editorial boards of over five, uh, 50, 50 journals, uh, including um, the, the Elsevier, Elsevier uh, Structural Engineering, where he is, uh, is the regional editor. He is a member of 20 academies of sciences, including uh, the Chinese Academy of Engineering and the US, uh, US Academy of Engineering in Washington. So as we can, uh, we can see, we can learn uh, the scientific activities and I would even say deeds of Professor Mank has been uh, have been recognized and awarded by many different communities worldwide and uh, in particular Professor uh, Mank uh, is, uh, was awarded the honorary doctorates of six universities. It is Kraków, Kiev, uh, Kiev, Prague, Leoben, Vilnius, and Innsbruck, and also honorary professor at Tonji University, as I already said, and with many, many prizes. Uh, so let me just uh, quote some of them. Distinguished Engineer Award of the College of Engineering of Texas Tech University, Austrian Cross of Honor for Science and Art, first class, golden, uh, Great Golden Decoration for Services to the Republic of Austria, Euler Medal of the European Community of Computational Methods in Light Sciences, and Nathan Newmark Medal of the American Society of Civil Engineers. And just to close this, this part, I would also mention that uh, one of the planet, a uh, small planet, as is written in the CV of, by Professor Mank, was called Mank by its discoverer, it is Professor Schmadel from the Heidelberg University. So uh, also in, uh, with Poland, Professor Mank has many close and strong uh, relations. And in Poland, Professor Mank enjoys very high recognition and respect for his results uh, scientific, in scientific research and activities supporting the development of science and scientists in Poland. Let me just uh, quote here some facts. He's a member of the Polish Academy of Sciences since 2000 since the year 2000 and obtained the doctoral uh, honorable degree, doctor of honoris causa of the Politechnika Krakowska. He is a holder uh, or laureate, we would say, of the Zienkiewicz Medal, which is issued by the Polish uh, Society of Computer Methods in Mechanics and is a holder of the Order of Merit of the Republic of Poland. And in one statement, we may say, Professor Mank is a friend of Poland. And for all this, I mean, congratulations for all these achievements. And let me say a big thank you to Professor Mank for all of this, which, uh, which he has done for science and in particular for Poland for us. Thank you very much, Professor Mank. And uh, today, uh, Professor Mank will uh, deliver, will discuss uh, the topic which is already displayed. I mean, the Hong Kong Zuhai Macau Bridge, the symbol of the witness development of modern China. And let me say just a just few words about this. I mean, it is going, this is going to be a lecture about human ambition, human uh, lively imagination, human, uh, I would say, vision of engineers. It is about uh, dreams and very successful uh, realization fulfillment. So we, uh, the list can be even longer, but you name it, 
after the lecture. So, Professor Monk, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much for this very kind and uh, flattering uh, introduction of my person. Uh, I wish that my wife had heard it. She wouldn't believe it. Uh, ladies and uh, gentlemen, uh, first of all, distinguished rector magnificus of Poznańska Polytechnika, Professor Jasnowski. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, let me first express my sincere thanks to the city of Poznań for accepting my nomination by Poznańska Polytechnika for this public lecture. I consider the invi invitation by the representatives of the hub city of the Województwo Wielkopolski, the cradle of the Polish nation, as a great honor. Let me also express my deep gratitude to Poznańska Polytechnika for my nomination for this public lecture. And let me last but not least say wholeheartedly thank you to Vice Dean Professor Mieczysław Kuczma for the initiation of this nomination and for his great efforts to organize this lecture under the severe constraints of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, this lecture is a public lecture, so it will not be entirely technical. There will be also some general argument in this lecture. Uh, let me begin with the outline. At first, I will describe the building of the immersed tunnel connecting the two parts of the Hong Kong Shuhai Macau Bridge, abbreviated as HCMB. Then, and this will be the technical part, the mechanical part, so to say, I will report on two sub projects of the joint Austro Chinese research project, bridging the gap by means of multi-scale structural analysis. I will report on two out of four sub-projects. The first one, title of it, reads as Microstructural Analysis of Impact and Blast Loading of Tunnel Linings. And the title of the second one reads as Multi-scale Analysis of Thermal Stresses in Cement Linings Due to Sudden Temperature Changes. In the final part of this lecture, I'll make a couple of brief comments on the witnessed development of modern China for almost 40 years. Ladies and gentlemen, let us have a look at this figure. It shows the course of the HCMB, including the tunnel, this is the tunnel at the seabed, connecting the two parts of the bridge. On the right, you see Hong Kong, uh, and at the other end, you see Macau and Shuhai. Uh, the length of the bridge is 35.6 kilometers. The length of the tunnel is 5.7 kilometers. The elements of the tunnel are produced on a natural island close to Hong Kong. Near two island. And the entrance buildings to the tunnels are located on two artificial inlet buildings, artificial islands. The two parts of the bridge are co connected by a road tunnel with three tracks in each direction. The tunnel is embedded in a trench, yes, in a trench, Filled in with gravel at the seabed, it consists of immersed, prefabricated, reinforced concrete elements. Take a look, please, at the lower part of this slide. You see here 5.6 kilometers of tunnel with 33 elements. I'll come back to that later on. This slide shows the East Artificial Island. 
an inlet structure into the tunnel at the seabed. I'm coming now to a brief description of the building of the tunnel. The tunnel consists of 33 elements. The length of an element is 180 meters. That's longer than the longest football grounds. An element consists of eight segments. Hence, the length of a segment is 22.5 meters. At first, the elements 1 to 29 are installed from the left to the right, followed by the elements 33 to 30 uh, from the right to the left. Finally, the gap between elements 29 and 30 is closed by a special element segment of 12 meters length. Uh, the left part of the figure indicates, I hope you can see it in the background, a uh, part of the reinforcement of a tunnel segment. And the right figure uh, refers to the placing of the concrete. You see here the reinforcement in the back and the concrete is placed onto it. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, this gives you an idea of the huge dimensions of the cross section. Almost 38 meters in width and 11 and a half meters in height. I'm coming now to uh, a description of uh, the production process. What you hear, see here is the factory for the production of the tunnel segments. Then the place of assembling the tunnel segments to the elements. The pool where you, wherein you see two elements and the gates to the sea. Uh, this uh, slide refers to the uh, shipping, say, out of the pool. After the segments have hardened, they are assembled to elements with the help of pre-stressing cables. Then the elements are sealed in order to float them from the place of production to the position of the installation. Then the gate is closed to the sea. The pool is filled with water in order to enable swimming of the elements. Then the gate is opened to allow for outflow of the water into the sea until the water level in the pool has sunk to the level of the sea. What you see here is the exit of the exit of a tunnel element uh, with the help of pontoons from the pool into the South China Sea. You see here two pontoons carrying the, the tunnel element. The distance from the place of production to the building site is approximately 12 kilometers. You see here two elements and uh, pontoons carrying them and several ships pulling these elements. Now the swimming tunnel reaches the building site, which is here. A temporary building site, of course. Uh, I'm coming now to a brief description of the installation of a tunnel element. This is a challenging task because of the following reasons. First, a tunnel element is nearly twice as long as a smaller soccer field. The largest immersion of the tunnel elements is approximately 50 meters. Uh, the sea is relatively shallow there. It's the estuary of the Pearl River into the South Chinese Sea. The length of the tunnel, I've said this before, is approximately 5.6 kilometers. And heavy seas make the installation of the tunnel elements more difficult. Uh, let me now briefly describe the process of immersion of a tunnel element. By means of fluting of containers inside the sealed tunnel element, the letter is immersed. The process of immersion is controlled from the pontoons with the help of ropes. The sketch is at the side of the figure. Here, 
refer to the production of a waterproof joint between two neighboring elements. Let me describe this in more detail. By means of hydraulic charm joints, the immersed tunnel element is pulled to the precedingly installed element until full contact along a sealing element is reached. The sealing element uh, results in a water-filled reservoir between the two vertical bulkheads of steel filled with water. Then the water is pumped out of the reservoir. The water pressure at the other end of the new element creates pressure on the sealing element. It results in sealing of the joints between the new and the precedingly installed elements. Then the bulkheads, the vertical parts, are removed and the second sealing element is installed in the pumped out region in the interior of the tunnel, resulting in a forced closed joint. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, as I said, uh, these uh, tunnel elements are immersed to the ground of the sea. And what you see here is the backfield of the immersed tunnel with gravel. Ladies and gentlemen, this slide shows the final segment of 12 meters length for closing the gap between the elements 29 and 30. Now, ladies and gentlemen, politi politicians all over the world, I think, like to open buildings. The same occurs in China. The photo you see here is the opening of the Hong Kong Shuhai Macau Bridge by President Xi Jinping in a ceremony in Shuhai, Province Guangdong, Canton, on October 23 of uh, 2018. One day later, the bridge was opened for public transport, uh, namely on, on October 24, 2018. But there's a big logistic problem uh, because uh, the special zone, Hong Kong, doesn't want to be over flooded by people coming from mainland China. So uh, they had to install some custom procedures which are quite complicated and so on. But this is a rather political question. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm coming now to a description of joint Austro-Chinese basic research accompanying the erection of the HCMB. The underlying research project has the title Bridging the Gap by Means of Multiscale Structural Analysis. The time period of this project <coughs> were the years 2015 to 2020. Financial support was obtained by the Austrian Science Fund and the Chinese Scholarship Board. Bridging the figurative, so the title actually has a double meaning, the figurative gap consisting of several length dimensions between the microstructure of concrete and tunnel linings as the mechanical counterpart of closing the gap between the two parts of the bridge by the immersed tunnel and the topographical, geographical gap between Hong Kong and Macau by the HCMP. So, you see, several gaps are closed. The aim of this research project was an assessment of the added value of multi-scale analysis of tunnel linings. I will soon describe briefly what multi-scale analyses are about. Research partners were the Geotechnical Department of the College of Civil Engineering of Tongs University, cooperating with the Institute for Mechanics of Materials and Structures of Technical University of Vienna since 2005. Uh, the College of Civil Engineering uh, uh, of Tongji University is uh, the best one in the country. I would add, however, that in theoretical aspects, say like mechanics, uh, I would probably uh, give the first rank to uh, Tsinghua University in Beijing. But in practical civil engineering, particularly geotechnical engineering, 
uh, Tongji University is the first one. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm coming now to uh, a brief description of multi-scale analysis for prognosis of the load carrying capacity of sector. First question, what are such analyses about? Well, despite their macroscopically homogeneous appearance, many building materials have an inhomogeneous microstructure. They contain several constituents that can be distinguished at a sufficiently small length scale. Multiscale analysis enables quantification of the influence of the microstructure on the macroscopic behavior of such materials. What is the practical significance of such analysis? Multiscale analysis enable realistic mathematical descriptions of the material behavior. Since the collapse of structures is often caused by material failure, the quality of prognosis of possible collapse scenarios strongly depends on the quality of these mathematical descriptions. Next question, where does the knowledge about such scenarios come from? Well, in order to prevent possible failures in civil engineering, or rather keep the damage caused by unforeseeable catastrophes for mass, structure and environment as small as possible, Research in structural mechanics is dealing intensively with the failure of structural elements and connected with it, with the colors of structures. The following two examples refer to this. The first one deals with the material reinforced concrete. What you see on this slide is the colors of three cooling towers of 140 meters height each, made of reinforced concrete in England in 1956. This happened during a hurricane force storm. The left figure shows the colors of the cooling tower. Maybe you can spot the crown of this shell here. Uh, the right figure shows the situation after the collapse of three cooling towers. The second example refers to the material wood. What is shown here in the figure is the collapse of a wooden ice rink in Bad Reichenhall, Germany, in early January 2006. The main reason for the thought of the collapse is degradation of the wood to wood adhesive bonded joint caused by moisture in the ice rink. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, let me now briefly describe the nature of multi-scale analysis for prognosis of the load carrying capacity of structure. Experimental simulations of the failure of building constructions are often technically and are financially unfeasible. Model analysis are difficult because of modeling of the reinforcement bus, for example. Uh, multi-scale analysis in the framework of the finite element method. This is a well-known numerical method, uh, probably one of the most powerful, if not the most powerful, in civil, mechanical, and other engineering fields. They are frequently a useful alternative. Now, uh, in multi-scale analysis, homogenization techniques are an important ingredient of multi-scale analysis of material parameters. Let, let me explain this with the help of this figure. The gray part here on the left of the figure symbolizes a structure. Its characteristic length dimension is denoted by uppercase L. And the stretch of the loaded area is denoted as uppercase lambda. Now take a look at the small dark gray part. I have zoomed it out. And what I have zoomed out is called a representative volume element abbreviated as RVE. Its characteristic length is denoted as lambda. And a necessary condition for the mathematical homogenization procedure is that lowercase l is at least 
by one order of magnitude smaller than uppercase n. This is reflected in this equation. Now this representative uh, volume element includes uh, some little in inclusions uh, called, uh, say, in concrete, the aggregates. In this simple case, they are modeled as little fields, but this is not a necessary condition. There are other ways of handling such situations. Now, the characteristic dimension of these inclusions is denoted as a lowercase d. This would be the diameter of such an inclusion here, uh, aggregate. And the characteristic quantity is the stiffness of this characteristic mechanical quantity. Now, in order to apply homogenization techniques, the dimension d, lowercase d, must also be one order of magnitude at least be smaller than lowercase d. And if these conditions apply, ladies and gentlemen, we can homogenize the heterogeneous material concrete consisting of the cement paste and the aggregate. And what we obtain is the homogenized uh, yes, volume element uh, with C home being the stiffness of the mechanically equivalent material. Uh, this is the so-called stiffness tensor, an important mechanical quantity. Ladies and gentlemen, concrete is a porous material. Its strengths and stiffness develop in the course of hydration. The mechanical properties are time dependent and frequently transport of often aggressive fluids needs to be considered. Consideration of the essential processes at the level of action is required. So what needs to be solved is a multi-scale, multi-field problem. As an example, I uh, present here uh, the problem of thermo-chemo-mechanical couplings since uh, Rector Magnificus is a chemical engineer, he will find here in the yellow part of this uh, little figure, chemistry, as one of the fields in our analysis. We have three fields, chemistry, temperature, and mechanics. And there are interactions between these fields. For example, between uh, temperature and chemistry. Hydration. Hydration of young concrete results in a temperature increase in the structure and consequently in an improvement of the mechanical properties of concrete. On the other hand, the temperature has an influence on the chemical reaction between the cement and water. Strains due to changes of temperature result in additional mechanical loading of the strain. Thermal strength. Ladies and gentlemen, this slide shows a typical multi scale model for concrete consisting of four different scales. The finest one is the so called CSH, calcium silicate hydrate scale, and uh, anhydrous cement scale. The characteristic length of the representative volume element. Uh, is between 10 to the minus 8 and 10 to the minus 6 meters. Then comes the cement paste scale. The characteristic length of the representative volume element is between 10 to the minus 6 and 10 to the minus 4 meters. And the inclusions are here gypsum, monosulfate, ettringit, Portland bead. These little inclusions. Then comes the mortar scale with L equal to 10 to the minus 2. And finally, the macro scale with L equal roughly 10 to minus 1. Uh, so what needs to be considered is, of course, the type of concrete, progressive hydration of young concrete, 
and in case of a fire load, dehydration. Hydration, ladies and gentlemen, results in a change of the material composition of the young concrete, which is considered at the hydrate and the clinker scale, respectively, and at the cement paste scale. The macroscopic material properties are determined by means of homogenization techniques on the basis of the morphology of the individual ingredients and of their mechanical properties on the three lower levels of consideration. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm coming now to the mechanical nucleus, if you will, uh, of my talk. I will report on two of the four sub-projects of the research project Bridging the gap by means of multi-scale structure analogy. In charge of the first one is Dr. Technik Eva Binder. She was a doctoral student at our university. Now she's a postdoctoral fellow at Linnaeus University in Wexia, Sweden. And she's about to finish her Chinese PhD studies in the framework of a so-called double degree program between the Technical University of Vienna and Tongji University, Shanghai. On June 25, she will have the defense of her Chinese thesis, and this will be done on, online. The uh, second sub-project about which I'm going to talk has the title Multi-Scale Analysis of Thermal Stresses in Cement Linings Due to Sudden Temperature Changes. Uh, in charge of this project is Dr. Technik Huiwang, also a PhD from Tongji University. Uh, he is now an assistant professor on the well-known Shanghai Chiotong University. He has successfully completed both his Austrian and Chinese doctoral studies in the aforementioned double degree program. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm coming uh, to the first project. The motivation for this is to treat exceptional load cases in tunneling by means of multi-scale analysis. Now, what are exceptional load cases? For example, traffic accidents or explosions, both resulting in high dynamic loading of concrete lines. The research question that is posed here reads as follows. Can high dynamic strengthening modeled uh, by multi-scale analysis? Well, there is experimental evidence that the strength increases with increasing loading rate. But let me make one thing is clear. By strength, we don't need, mean here a material property. We mean a structural effect. The figure which you see here relates the dynamic strength increase factor, which is the ratio of the dynamic over the static strength uh, on the strain rate, dimension of which is one over second. You see here experimental results uh, by many research groups all over the world. And of course, there's a large scatter of these experimental results. However, we realize that with increasing strain rate, there's a trend to an increase of the so-called dynamic strength, particularly in the high dynamic testing regime with strain rates larger than one over second. Uh, how do we model high dynamic strength in compression tests? Uh, well, Dr. Binder investigated both compression and tension, but because of time constraints, I restrict myself to compression. You see here a specimen subjected to compression, and you see here a crack. In other words, under certain load level, uh, the specimen is splitting. In uh, compression tests, crack propagation typically occurs in the loading direction. Actual splitting, as I said before. We assume that crack propagation occurs along nanoscopic interface, that the speed of cracking is approximately equal to the Rayleigh wave speed. 
and that is the radio wave speed in turn is approximately equal to the shear wave speed, uh, which is equal to the square root of the shear modulus, a typical uh, stiffness property in mechanics over the density of the material. Dynamic strengthening occurs during crack propagation, and the dynamic strength is assumed to be reached when the first crack splits the specimen. Let us have a look, look at this figure. It shows the stress as a function of time for three different stress rates, sigma dot stress rates. And you see that with increasing stress rates, that means with increasing slope of the straight line, the difference between the dynamic strength and the static strength, the black line, is increasing. Now let us have a look at the two brackets below the abstractor axis. The green one shows the duration of loading up to the static strength, and the black one, the duration of crack propagation starting after the quasi-static strength has been reached. The mathematical formula of the model is given on top of the slide. The dynamic strength is equal to the static strength plus a term that is the product of the so-called stress rate, strain rate by modulus of elasticity. Uh, this is also a classical stiffness property in engineering. Uh, and the duration of crack propagation, which is the rate, uh, the ratio of the crack propagation length, LRT over Vs. We divide this by F stat and obtain the formula for the dynamic uh, increase factor DRF, 1 plus something. It's a simple expression and it does not contain any fitted parameter. So what we learn here that high dynamic strengthening is proportional to uh, the crack propagation length L sub C. And this crack propagation length is a problem because we don't know it up uh, Now, uh, how do we cope with this uncertainty regarding the crack propagation in compression tech? Well, Dr. Binder investigated two extreme scenarios. Extreme scenario one is characterized by the assumption that cracking starts at the surface of the specimen uh, here, and that we have one propagating crack tip from top to the bottom. Consequently, the crack propagation length L sub C is equal to H. Extreme scenario two is characterized by the assumption that cracking starts at the center of the specimen. So we have two propagating crack tips, one in this direction and the other one downwards. Consequently, the crack propagation L sub C is H over 2. I'm coming now to validation of the hypothesis. And I begin with validation for the cement paste for tests conducted by Fisher et al. Take a look at the left figure. It shows the dynamic strength increase factor as a function of the strain rate, 1 over S. You see our two analytical results for the two scenarios, LC is 1 and LC is 0.5, and you see the experimental result. So the degree of agreement is quite reasonable. The same can be said uh, for the material water. Test results come from growth at all. In each of these uh, figures, you see the two curves for the two extreme scenarios. It's different for the first concrete test, the test spectrum. Here, ladies and gentlemen, you only see one curve, the one that refers to the second extreme scenario. The reason for this being that fortunately for this situation, we have a result from the experimental failure mode and it clearly shows that uh, the extreme scenario 2 applies. 
So, uh, and you can also spot here that the degree of agreement of uh, the experimental and the numerical values is quite good. The same can be said about the test results by how at all. A few words about the multi-scale model for stiffness and strength of concrete of the HCMB without mathematics. Uh, we have four scales, the finest one, hydric foam scale, then the cement paste scale, the concrete scale, and the reinforced concrete scale. Let us first concentrate on the left figure. It shows the modulus of elasticity as a function of the quasi-static strength. You see here our analytical results and you see experimental results. Uh, degree of agreement is quite good. Then you see four quarters, one, two, three, four. Uh, they refer to three different values of quasi-static strength. And I need these values for explaining the next slide. These uh, crosses refer to different values of quasi-static strength, and implicitly they refer to different instants of time after casting of concrete. The right figure shows the shear modulus and Poisson's ratio, mechanical quantities, as a function of the quasi-static strength. Unfortunately, for these quantities, we have no experimental values. Uh, well, what for did I need these little crosses? I needed them for explaining the influence of concrete hardening on the high dynamic strength. You see here a modification of the previously given formula. It's a, a term here which is more or less constant. Let me concentrate to one of the two figures on the right one. It shows the dynamic strength as a function of the strain rate for the four different static strains, class static strains. That means for implicitly for four different instants of time after casting of concrete. Obviously, say with increase of this time, uh, hardening increases. And uh, then with increase of this time, also the dynamic strain. So, for one value of the strain rate, uh, the value of the dynamic strength are the greater, the greater the static strength is. So, ladies and gentlemen, so much for the first of the two examples. I hope it was not too mathematical. I'm coming now to the second uh, sub-project, the motivation for which is thermal degradation of concrete tunnel structures and its impact on the integrity of tunnels. Take a look, please, at the figure. It shows the Mont Blanc hybrid tunnel after the Great Fire in March of 1999. We are uh, interested in a specific degradation mechanism. There are several high temperature degradation mechanisms. One is uh, thermal decomposition, resulting from dehydration and decarbonation. The other one are thermal stresses. They may be the consequence of macrostructural constraints or microstructural constraints in form of a mismatch of thermal expansion coefficients of cement paste and aggregates. I will concentrate in this part of my lecture on this mismatch. Please take a look at the table. It shows values of the thermal expansion coefficient for different types of rock or mineral ranging from dense crystalline porous limestone to quartz silica shale and chert. Take a look now please at the figure on the left of the slide. It shows the thermal expansion coefficient, CTE, as a function of the relative humidity, both for the aggregates, there's practically no dependent. Take a look at the red test curve, and on the cement days, there's a significant dependence, as you can see here, 
approximately for 65, 60, 70 of uh, relative humidity, we have a peak value of the CPE. Now, uh, excuse me, I cannot explain it without a little bit of mathematics. What you see here is the multi-scale model for Conte. And this shows such a representative volume element. The pink uh, part uh, refers to the cement phase, and the little blue aggregates uh, refer to the aggregate. So what we need to know for the analysis is the volume fraction of these two phases of the aggregate and the cement phase, the thermal expansion coefficient, and the <coughs> and the elastic stiffness tensor. And the goal of this research is to find a value of the thermal expansion coefficient for the homogenized material concrete consisting of the aggregates and the cementate. At first, I must describe the microscopic behavior, starting with the eigenstrains for the aggregate and the cementate. These are for mechanicians well-known expression, thermal expansion coefficient, temperature uh, difference, and the so-called unit tensor mathematical quantity for the cementase and for the aggregate. <coughs> they are taking the negative of the double dot product of uh, the elastic stiffness tensor and the eigenstrain tensor, we obtain the so-called phase eigenstrain. And then comes the homogenization, the, the homogenization procedure to mathematically describe the macroscopic behavior in terms of the stressor, stress tensor of the composite material. It contains, of course, uh, the homogenized stiffness, c -com, and the homogeneous eigenstress, and both terms contain the respective quantities of the two different phases, aggregates and cement phase. A is a mathematical quantity, the so-called strain concentration tensor, actually a mathematical mechanical quantity. The task of this uh, exercise is to obtain a so-called bottom-up homogenization, the thermal expansion coefficient of concrete. And this is given by this relatively uh, complicated formula. You see it contains information from the aggregate and information from the cement phase. Take please now a look at the table on this slide. It shows the input in red color for the aggregate and the cement phase. In form of values of the volume function, uh, the modulus of elasticity, also called Young's modulus, the shear modulus, and the thermal expansion coefficient. And in the third line, you see our analysis results for multi-scale analysis. You see that for concrete, for example, the value for the elastic modulus is 43.30, so it's somewhere in the middle between the values for the aggregate, 60 gigapascal, and the values for the cement base, uh, 22.34. Similar situation for the shear modulus and for the thermal expansion coefficient. Uh, well, uh, these numbers now in the third line are input for macroscopic thermomechanical analysis. Dr. Hui Wang investigated a reinforced concrete beam subjected to heat, fire at the bottom end. Uh, the uh, bottom surface has here the temperature uh, boundary condition, so to say, T up, and uh, the top surface has the reference temperature. The cross section is shown here as a height of 150 millimeters and a width of 72 uh, centimeters. Sorry. And uh, in order to be able to apply the simple one dimensional heat conduction equation, 
we have to thermally insulate the side surface. You see this here? Okay, thermal insulation of the side surface. The heat equation is well known to mechanicians. Uh, uh, T stands uppercase T for the temperature, lowercase T for the time. Y is the vertical coordinate of the cross section, and A is the thermal diffusivity of concrete. This is a well known uh, problem, and it has an analytical solution in developed form. As you can see here, you find that in good textbooks on thermal elasticity and plasticity. Uh, this is a normalized quantity of the temperature uh, as a function here in this table of the normalized eight. Uh, so this normalized temperature quantity as a function of the normalized eight for four different instants of normalized time. The smallest one, 10 to the minus three, gives this dashed curve. And obviously, after such a short time, most of the beam is cross-section is not affected by the temperature it increased by heating, only the lower part. When you reach stationary condition, take a look at the dash topic line, of course, then the whole beam is affected by it. Ladies and gentlemen, these temperature fields are now input for finite element uh, stress simulation. I'm presenting results uh, from microscopic finite element analysis for a moderate fire load of uh, 100 degrees of centigrade. What is shown in the two figures is the distribution of the actual normal surface over the height of the two beams for four different instants of time. Let's have a look at the left figure. It refers to a simply supported beam. And you see that, uh, for example, for a relatively short time of 80 over 8 squared to 10 to the minus 3, we have the full line here. And interestingly, in the lower part here, we have tension. And when stationary conditions are uh, achieved, we have, of course, in a simply supported beam, no stresses. This is well known to mechanicians. So we have the dash dotted line signaling actual normal stress equal to zero. It's of course different for ground speed. Finally, uh, let me show you uh, for the temperature, say for the time instant, 80 over 8, that is 10 to the minus 2, the three actual stresses, that means the actual stresses in the three coordinate direction. X, Y, and C for simply supported beam and for clamped beam. Let us concentrate on the left figure. And let us look here at this lower part. And what you can observe, that we have a three actual tensile stress there. And concrete doesn't like this very much. Particularly if you take into consideration that the reinforcement is on top and in the bottom. And you would not realize that you have possibly cracked in this part, uh, in this part of the structure. So uh, you have to be very careful in such a situation. Three actual tension. Ladies and gentlemen, this brings me to the end of uh, my report on two sub-projects of the joint research project, bridging the gap by means of multi-state structural analysis. The project has proved the added value of multi-state structural analysis. It has underlined the importance of both material tests and structural large-scale experiments. Actually, I haven't shown this here in my talk. Uh, there were two other research projects, and both were uh, connected with large-scale experiments. And last but not least, and as an academic teacher, I consider this as particularly important. It has enabled participation of highly qualified students from both Tongji University and the Technical University of Vienna in challenging research work 
in the framework of their doctoral studies. Tongji University has laboratories uh, which are even outbeating top uh, laboratories from American universities. Uh, we don't have such excellent laboratories, such big laboratories, but we have uh, uh, a rather high analytical and numerical capacity. So uh, our, say, combined research uh, combined uh, the best of two worlds. Ladies and gentlemen, let me use the last part of this lecture uh, with a brief and certainly very incomplete description of the witnessed development of modern China. It started uh, with my activity as a UNIDO expert at uh, the Genjo Research Institute of Mechanical Engineering. Quite astonishing. I'm a civil engineer and was hired uh, by the mechanical engineer. Uh, to be honest, I was very lucky because UNIDO proposed a uh, Russian uh, scientist to the Chinese but the Chinese didn't want to accept a Russian. So the next was me, probably, on the list. The period of time was September to December 1981, so almost 40 years ago. The task of my work there was instruction and guidance in computer-oriented stress analysis. This research institute was founded in 1971, in the form of a transfer of a department of another research institute from Beijing to Zhengzhou. Zhengzhou is the capital of uh, the Hunan province. This province is viewed by anthropologists as the cradle of Chinese, uh, including suburbs at that time. It had to had 1.70 million inhabitants. Probably it has many more now. The Hunan province has 70, at, in 1981, 70 million inhabitants. It was it's a relatively poor province. Well, uh, UNIDO would probably not have sent me to one of the richest uh, provinces. My accommodation in this time was in a guest house built at the time of the close political relationship between the People's Republic of China and the for, former Soviet Union. And it was, uh, well, the accommodation was as good as possible. The computer, but not really very good. Uh, uh, making telephone calls to Europe was a big problem. The computer facilities of the research uh, institute were probably less than what you have now on an average uh, laptop but it occupied three big rooms, and one could only uh, move in these rooms with slippers on. Ladies and gentlemen, probably this cannot be read very, very well. It's the title page of my report to the United Nations uh, uh, Industrial Development Organization after my three months of uh, work there. My tasks were actually to deliver a finite element course and to give advice on specific mechanical problem, problems. Uh, the only problem for me was sometimes they came out of uh, mechanical engineering and I had to use the nights to study literature which I took from Vienna on some mechanical engineering uh, aspects. Well, my first impression in Beijing uh, was the Beijing airport. After a beautiful flight over the Karakor Mountains, K2 and so on, over the desert Gobi, I arrived in Beijing and the airport uh, was very small. I, uh, say in a provincial city of Austria, probably, you would have uh, a larger airport. Now compare this situation with the one of the Beijing airport in 2019. So you see the difference. Uh, my first impression of Tiananmen Square was similar to what you see on the left slide. 
masses of people on bicycles. The bicycles had no lights in the night. This was a problem to cross the street. Almost no cars, only official cars. Take a look at uh, Tiananmen Square uh, in the year 2018. You see almost no bicycle, many cars, uh, many of them electricity powered. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm coming now to a brief report on a small diplomatic mission, so to say. I was asked to undertake during my stay in China 40 years ago. I was asked by Cardinal König, the Archbishop of Vienna, to observe the situation of the Catholic Church in China in Zhengzhou. In the year 1981, there were approximately 1,700 faithful. Most Catholics, Christians, are in the big coastal towns like Tianjin, Shanghai, and so on. Uh, who is Cardinal Kuen? Well, uh, he is uh, the person who orchestrated, to a large extent, the election of Pope John Paul II. During the conclave, the cardinals are forbidden to speak one with the other, but before the conclave, they can do this. And this is what Cardinal Koenig did, and it contributed significantly uh, to the election of John Paul II. Uh, in August 1981, uh, a church uh, was opened in Chenjo, the first opening after the Cultural Revolution. That was one month before my arrival. Initially, the building was in a desolate state. During my three months stay in Genjo, on own initiative of the faithful, the situation has fundamentally changed. Restrictions on baptisms and church weddings against the setting of the opposition of the church to the one-child policy of the Chinese government was one of the many problems between the church and the state. I was allowed uh, to make an interview with the priest and of course in the presence of a member of the Communist Party uh, about the conditions for the return of the schismatic Chinese Catholic Church to the Roman Catholic Church. The answer was uh, the Vatican must accept the one China doctrine that means it must uh, abolish all uh, connections with Taiwan. Ladies and gentlemen, after my return to Vienna, I made a report uh, to the Cardinal and I have translated it for this lecture from German. Dated uh, December 21, 1981. Let me read it to you. Beside the Taiwan question and the one of the recognition of the existing hierarchy of the Chinese Catholic Church by the Vatican, I consider the propagation of the one-child policy by the government as a great problem for convergence of the Vatican and Beijing. Presently, a more or less strong, predominantly administrative pressure is exerted on young married couples to declare support of the one-child policy. In fairness, it must be said that the government is well aware about the sacrifice of the generation of young people concerned and that for the next 20 to 30 years, there are practically no alternatives to the mentioned compulsory measure if the food supply of the then 1 billion people shall be guaranteed at the present state of the Chinese agriculture. Finally, I want to express my conviction that the modus vivendi between the Vatican and Beijing would reduce the moral conflict of many Chinese Catholics in full consciousness of the objections to negotiations with the government, I consider such negotiations as the better map outweigh than putting hopes on the extension of an underground church. Under the given circumstances, the latter would, on the longer run, probably be doomed to failure. Well, ladies and gentlemen, personal comment. Meanwhile, the mentioned modus vivendi seems to have become reality 
also people don't speak a lot about it, expectedly not appreciated ever, everywhere. If you enter the, the cathedral in uh, Shanghai, you see when you enter a big picture of uh, Pope John Paul II. And ladies and gentlemen, if you have read already today's newspapers, you will have found that the Chinese government from now on allows uh, couples to have three children. Twin, say 40 years ago, the situation was completely different, but now we have, uh, for well-known reasons, a shortage by 12% of women, and uh, we have many Chinese people who were, say, educated entirely by the grandparents, being the only child, uh, many of them are socially not as well uh, developed as this should be the case. Well, this is the answer of the Cardinal six days later, and we reported all this to the Vatican. I'm coming now uh, to uh, a brief uh, description, won't take long, of the observation of the development of modern China in the framework of several research corporations. From 81 to 85, uh, I cooperated with the Gender Research Institute of Mechanical Engineering, guiding a PhD student and cooperation with guest scientists from uh, the Chinese Institute at the Institute for Mechanics of Materials and Structures of the Technical University of Vienna. From 89 to 94, I cooperated with the China Aeronautical Establishment, again guiding PhD students and Guest, uh, giving guest lecture. Since 2005, and this is now actually for 16 years, I'm cooperating with the Department of Geotechnical Engineering of the College of Civil Engineering of Dongji University, Shanghai, guiding together with uh, uh, colleagues from Vienna University of Technology, from our institute, PhD students being involved in joint conferences, since 2012, holding a chair professorship, and uh, from 2015 to 2020, being involved in a joint research project about which I've reported. Since 2015, I'm also participating in specific activities of the Chinese Academy of Engineering in editing scientific journals, holding, uh, being involved in joint symposia, for example, between the Chinese and the American and uh, Academy and the Royal Society of London and with other academies. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, my place of work is Shanghai. Take a look at the left figure. It shows the Shanghai Bund uh, with its colonial style, colonial type buildings. Uh, take a look, and you see here the southern part. Look how the southern part has changed between 1990 and uh, uh, 2018. You see many large buildings, uh, say particularly you can spot the famous Shanghai Tower. When I came to China in 1981, it took me a whole night to travel from Beijing to Zhengzhou. The train in China, this figure is taken from the year 1978. You see all people still in Mao suits, <coughs> had a speed of 30 to 40 kilometers. Take a look at the right figure. It shows uh, a high or highest speed train in China. The figure comes, the photo comes from 2018, and the speed is 350 kilometers per hour. So sometimes when I have to go from Shanghai to Beijing, I take the train, it's more comfortable and it takes about four hours. If say the location is say not very close to the airport, there's almost no difference between the rail trip and uh, the airplane trip. Ladies and gentlemen, this brings me to the end of my lecture. Uh, the Hong Kong Shuha uh, Macau Bridge is an outstanding symbol of the modern development of China. Not only in a scientific and an engineering sense, 
but also in a figurative sense. Finally, I would make a couple of acknowledgements. I would like uh, to acknowledge support by Dr. Chilong Shang, Assistant Research Fellow from Tungji University, Dr. Eva Binder, a postdoctoral fellow from Linnaeus University, I've said this before, Dr. Dr. Hui Wang, an assistant professor from Shanghai Chetong University. Uh, they all have uh, provided material for this lecture. And I would also like to thank uh, M.S. Gabriele Ostrovsky in the form of preparation of the PowerPoint presentation of this lecture. Uh, I wish to acknowledge this gratefully. And last but not least, I wish to acknowledge uh, the great help in this uh, uh, in this online presentation and its, uh, in this preparation, IT support by uh, Martina Pell. Uh, she is in charge of all this and is the good spirit behind of me. Ladies and gentlemen, the last uh, photo shows uh, our research team. In the middle, you see Professor Yuan Yong. Uh, in the background, uh, you see Professor Bernhard Pichler. Then you see two Chinese uh, young doctors, Dr. Hui Wang and Dr. Chilong Shang. Uh, then you see the Austrian students, Dr. Thomas Lappel, and uh, the young lady, Eva Binder, who will get her second doctorate in Shanghai on 25th of uh, this month. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you very much for your attention. It was indeed a great honor and pleasure to deliver this lecture at Poznan uh, University of Technology. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor uh, Bank, for the brilliant and impressive presentation and uh, now we have some minutes for questions, comments, and discussion. So please take this opportunity to ask Professor about his experience and about his observations of the modern China. It is a liberty to only uh, to uh, express my gratitude and many thanks for you great, let me say, experience, uh, deeper knowledge, uh, not only uh, to civil engineering, but mechanics. And I really like that you mentioned about chemistry because it's chemistry is a linkage of, let me say, people. So, so, so thank you very much, uh, uh, distinguished Professor Monk. Thank you very much for your friends and kind, uh, my great honor to have delivered this lecture. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any further questions or? Yes, Professor, it was nice being here. It was very, really, really nice. It's a marvelous structure that you have. Can you so turn on your camera, see. please? Then we can see you and then we will understand more. Yes. Can you, can you see? I mean, it is, it is a student of mine. Yes, please. Uh, Hello, good afternoon, everybody. This is Monib. I'm a student at PUT. I don't, I, I don't see the student. Oh, is it Mr. Avotunda? No, Professor, it's Mr. Munibda. Uh, I... Uh, okay, yeah, 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 okay. The presentation was uh, so grateful. And my concern over it is, what you have done for the structural health monitoring in that structure? That's my question, basically. Uh, stru uh, structural health monitoring, we were not involved in structural health monitoring of this structure. We were not involved. We were involved here in uh, multi-scale analysis and uh, uh, multi-scale, say, structural health monitoring was done mainly by Chinese, uh, Chinese colleagues. Uh, so no involvement in this. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any further questions? seems to be the case that there are no more uh, could i could i just ask a, a, a question i mean a request for a, for a comment because it is known that uh, uh, but it shouldn't be understood in any political direction yes but 
but uh, quite generally, uh, it is known that capitalism and socialism was born in Europe and many other con uh, ISIM's concept, I would say, uh, were also born in Europe and they are actually the product of European civilization. Many of them were implemented or were adopted to some extent in China. And uh, my question would be, what is your opinion, your advice? What uh, are there any, any um, how I should say, attitudes or organizational uh, solutions uh, in, uh, used in China which could be borrowed or transferred to Europe to strengthen uh, the development of Europe of uh, the Europe, Europe, Europe of the European, let's say in general. Would you would yeah. you could uh, you see some of this? Because this is a, as we understood, as we can understood, it is a, uh, as we can understand, it is a a complex problem. Yes, I mean functioning of uh, societies and. Uh, uh, economies and, and many others, uh, but we, we can see that China reaches now out of the space, actually, yes, to Mars. And so, so this is a, a product uh, not just from, from yesterday. It is a result of, uh, as we could see, of many, many hard, uh, many years of hard work. Uh, well, uh, it indeed is a very difficult question. And the question is whether the things that could be, uh, say, imported to Europe, whether we would really like them. Uh, first of all, I think this is no secret, China is no democratic country. Uh, and uh, uh, if you look into Chinese history, uh, they always had revolutions and some emperors, some di dynasties, were overthrown and new ones came. China is, from what I've seen, a deeply capitalistic country. This sounds a little bit odd, but uh, it's a degree of capitalism, say, which probably would not be very welcome to you. Now, the success of China in the sciences is the consequence of uh, a political system which we would not appreciate. Uh, say a system like we have in Austria where say, uh, the opposition is fighting with the government and accusing the government, the government fights back. Uh, you can afford this in a highly developed society. But in China, well, that wouldn't work. Please keep in mind, my report was very incomplete. It was on, say, Shanghai, Beijing, and so on. But this is not China. There are several hundred millions of farmers who live in poverty. And you could not even, say, hurt them by administrative measures if they had more children, because they had nothing to lose. You could hurt people, say, in the big cities. So, uh, the, say sometimes I would say the scientific eff efforts of the government and of the universities are very high. I'm not sure, say, whether I'm not talking about Poland, whether Austrian students would appreciate that. Uh, the publication pressure on the young people is tremendous. And uh, they get a contract for two years, and in these two years, they have uh, to bring in other projects, to write eight papers, uh, to give talks, and organize symposia. It's hard to do this without foreign help in, in big teams and so on. And sometimes it tempts people, uh, it tempts people to, how to say, uh, employ unethical uh, strategies. Now, uh, I would say the positive attitude for science is definitely here. But uh, 
I am afraid I wouldn't like to see some of the practices to achieve this success at our university. Students have to have some time for celebrating, for being together. Uh, also, people need to be able to express that they are not satisfied with everything that the government does. So, uh, if you ask me what we could import, I wouldn't know many things. Keep in mind, the, the Chinese army, for example, is not the army of the country, it's the army of the Communist Party. It's a party army, whatever strong it is. Uh, uh, I have students who tell me, my father can now go to church because he is retired. Okay? Uh, this recalls, uh, this reminds me of what my wife has told me from the 1950s in Poland, that you could you should have gone to another village if the child is to be baptized, things like that. But this was, say, after World War II, after communism, and, uh, and they have it like this in China. Uh, I'm well aware that all my students are members of the party. No one would be allowed to come who is not a member of the party. The party members are about uh, 70 million of 1.3 billion. Uh, so uh, I'm absolutely sure that the Chinese will have great scientific success. Because, uh, first of all, they put a lot of money in big laboratories, which we don't have, and also the Americans don't have them, with the exception of that. They, the, the Tong, she has the largest shaking table. They don't have such a shaking table at Caltech in Los Angeles. Uh, so uh, they have, but if you look, say, how students are sitting there at the university, we couldn't do that. We try to give students a room, or maybe two people are in a room. In China, they are sitting, say, like chicken, one next to the other one. So uh, the success is here. Because obviously, if you have 1.4, 1.3 billion people, you make uh, the exam for entrance to the university on the same day. And the best, the very best, come to Tongshi in civil engineering, then they come to Tsinghua and so on. So, Professor Kuchma, uh, I'm, I appreciate very much uh, the success uh, with China had. When I lectured in 1981, uh, the food had a bad nutritional value. People were very tired. This is all gone. This is all gone. But it will take a long time till, say, the, how to say, the success which you see in the big city comes to the countryside. Maybe it's a positive thing. Our, our government doesn't see it so positive, is the new Silk Road Initiative, which for civil engineers is a great thing. Uh, building roads, say, uh, in the western Chinese area, which is topographically very difficult, uh, to Kazakhstan and then further, further to Europe. Uh, but we have to be aware that China is becoming a world power, and uh, politicians have to live with this, uh, we can't deny. But say, what could be important, uh, important to Poland, I wouldn't give you an advice. <laughs> okay. give an advice. No. But you have said a lot, we learned a lot from what you have said. So thank you very much. And uh, actually the time is, is running out. Uh, are there any questions, further questions, and if... May I ask a question concerning Star Trek? Yes, yes I, please. I, I, like, I like to ask, it's just a far luck. Good morning. Are you speaking with me? Can I see the person? Because okay, I will try. Turn on your camera. Okay. I like to ask about the structure, because a tunnel structure is a long object immersed in water. Yeah. I think it's 
sensitive for eight earthquake for any seismic uh, phenomenon. So, was there any analysis? Yes. During the designing process concerning this basement uh, yes, presentation? Uh, yes. Uh, this is one of uh, the parts of the thesis of uh, Dr. Eva Binder. Uh, they have, I said before, they have the largest shaking table uh, of the world, I think. Uh, can do vertical, horizontal, longitudinal direction. It cannot do torsional movements of the structure. This was done in China. Uh, and the problem we had with this is that the data uh, were not very complete. So it was very difficult uh, for Dr. Binder uh, to, how to, how to say, extract concluding facts that are the basis of a theory. Uh, but obviously, for such a large project, uh, seismicity plays a big role. Uh, I, uh, and there are other dissertations in China which are specifically dealing with it. But yes, you are right. I mean, seismic analysis were carried out. And what I learned from these seismic analysis is that in order to extract something and to build a theory of them, they have to be very systematic. Uh, and maybe Professor Kutschma will understand if I say it in German, where vieles mist, mist oft mal mist. Mist oft mal mist, yes, complicated. This is rubbish. Yes. <laughs> uh, so it was done, uh, but uh, we were not satisfied with the way it was done. Thank you very much for your answer and for a very nice presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, is there any further questions? Seems to be the case, but not. So I would like to 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 say once uh, once again a, a big thank you for uh, Professor Monk for his excellent and uh, very excuse me very insightful lecture, lecture lesson for us and for the ask questions and the discussion. And now, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, let me close uh, the meeting uh, thanking you for taking part in, uh, in the meeting and uh, asking the questions. And uh, I wish you, you stay in good health and wish you, wish you to enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care and see you soon in Poznan. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.